so okay this this talk is also going to be about um garbage circuits and um now we have like a, a different goal uh, from what Karsten was talking about. So Karsten was talking about the problem of um, identifiable board. Uh, and what we look into in this paper is how to do garbled circuits when you have many, many parties. Because as, as Karsten was describing, like you have this kind of blow up of, uh, in the size of parties uh, for, uh, for your gates. So this is joint work with uh, an urban frame, Kelong Kong, Ramon Ri, Emmanuel Orsini, Nigel Smart, and myself. And you know, if these are also like too many authors for you to remember, I'm only working now on papers that have like cool acronyms. So this is like the oh, this is working. That's not working, is it? No. Okay. So this is like you can this is like the big cost paper if you want, or, or if you if you're happy with um small permutation of the authors. This is also a Bose paper. It's like the co-Bose paper. Um, so there you go, uh, your, your stupid joke of the day. Um, <laughs> OK, so just uh, taking things uh, slowly from the beginning, you have like two main approaches for efficient MPC. You can either do like secret sharing kind of protocols or um, or you can go for garbled circuits, right? So, and these all these two approaches have their own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, if you do secret sharing uh, protocols, these are, these are very good for arithmetic circuits and low latency networks. And this comes from the fact that these protocols have a lot of rounds of interaction depending on the on the multiplicative depth of the circuit. But on the other hand, they also have like a small communication complexity. And they are also very cheap in general uh, for computation. So if, if, if you have one party like evaluating, you have this kind of king approach where parties send shares to a party who is like a king computing the thing and then sending shares back, then you, you only have this kind of uh, linear overhead in the number of parties for, for the, on the size of your, of your circuit. On the other hand, garbage circuit protocols are very good if you want to compute like Boolean functions and you are on a very slow network, where, where with a slow, I mean like high latency. So you have a constant number of rounds, latency is not going to kill you. Uh, but on the other hand, you have uh, this problem that the size of the gates depends on the number of parties. And uh, additionally, evaluating these gates is also going to depend in the number of parties. So uh, if, if you were paying attention to Karsten's talk, you, you, are, you have this, um, these four rows are now divided into n rows themselves. And each of these n rows is encrypted under all the n keys of the parties. So this gives you like a quadratic uh, overhead in the number of parties when you want to evaluate these gates. So uh, what we look into in this paper is like how to get rid of this uh, factor of n there. Um, and this is something that has been done before, but only for passively secure adversaries. Um, so this was a, a work by uh, some of the authors in this paper, um, and also Yehuda Lindo. And uh, also this, this previous work didn't have the free XOR optimization. So that's something we do as well. And by, by reducing the, the size of these gates, we also achieve to like, you know, reduce this computational overhead. And now we look much more similar to, to how things are done in the secret sharing world. Because, uh, yeah, this, if you want to scale your protocols, you need to care about something like this. So if you have n evaluators, we have like the same complexity as in secret sharing. If you have a single evaluator of the garbled circuit, then you have a better complexity if you want to, to cheat a bit and look at the overall for like a single rather than the bottleneck. Um, OK, so um, let's get into that. Uh, so. Again, a recap of the set of the setting in this talk. We want to do constant run protocols uh, using garbage circuits. The, the gates should have a size that is independent of the number of parties. We want something that has like a concrete efficiency, and we deal with active adversaries that can corrupt actually like any different kind of thresholds of corruption. But we we work for this one is majority full threshold. We also work for smaller thresholds. Okay. So um, yeah, how does how do garbage circuits work uh, on the protocol level? 
here comes the slide recycling. Um, okay, so I guess the participants didn't vary so much between both talks, but I'll just go very quickly over this. So you have two parties, Alice and Bob, right? Alice is going to garble, which is um, some circuit. So you can think of this as some sort of encrypted version of the circuit uh, Alice and Bob want to evaluate. She's, she sends this to Bob. And now Alice and Bob are going to engage in some interactive uh, input encoding protocol that gives uh, Bob some uh, garbled inputs, which he can use to evaluate the garbled circuit and get the result of the actual circuit on the actual inputs. And once you have this, you can just send the result back to Alice. Everyone gets the output, we get security. Okay, now um, you could think, okay, so I can do now garbled circuits with multiple parties very easily, right? Let's just, when I put these gray boxes, I, I, I'm, I mean that you're using MPC. So let's just put this on the MPC box and let's just compute all of these steps, uh, you know, obliviously. And then we're fine, right? You can just think, okay, uh, yeah, we, 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 we use any, any protocol here to, to evaluate this, uh, these smaller blue boxes, right? And uh, as these boxes have some fixed depth, uh, this will be a constant ground protocol still. Um, but as I was saying, okay, this is, this is going to check, you know, the fact that this is constant ground, the, the size of the gates is going to be independent of the number of parties. You can get active security if, the, if your gray box is actively secure, but this is going to be extremely inefficient. Uh, if you want to, uh, to compute this, uh, if you remember one of the goals in the previous talk, was uh, to deal with uh, not having to do zero knowledge or anything about these PRFs that you use uh, in order to, to garble your gates. So now imagine not doing a PRF, but actually like obliviously computing the PRF. So things get like much, much worse, right? Um, okay, so what, what's the, the BMR protocol? Recycling coming as well. Uh, it's very similar actually. Uh, to, to what you see on the previous slide. Uh, we have our gray box only on this garble and input encoding uh, parts of, of, of uh, Jiao, if you want to think about that. Uh, so that's done like obliviously with an MPC with some small footnote that, that I will come to. And uh, then you have uh, an online phase where parties evaluate the circuit uh, locally. So no MPC involved there. Um, so yeah, parties garble the circuit, garble the inputs, once they have this, they can get the output. Uh, so what's this footnote that I was talking about is that the PRFs in the BMR protocol are actually uh, not computed uh, within this uh, generic MPC uh, box. Uh, they are actually provided, like parties are kind of evaluating the, the PRFs locally, and then they provide them as input to this uh, generic MPC. So, um, and this is something you can do uh, among other things because you have this uh, different, you have this vectorized version of, of, of Java where you have all this uh, one key per party. Okay, um, so how, do, how does uh, BMR work on the gate level compared with Yao? I have been talking about this during the talk because you know you have the previous one, so might as well do it. Uh, but okay, I think this slide, maybe we can actually, uh, skip because I also think you don't see my mouse, right? Or do you? No, okay. So, I don't see your mouse. Okay. Uh, okay, so yeah, you garble the truth table of the gate, and then um, you, you have one key for every possible uh, value on that wire. So you have a key corresponding to the zero value on the, on the wire, or a key uh, for the corresponding value one. You encrypt this truth table, then you permute the rows, and, and that's your, your uh, garble gate in Java. So now uh, this is new compared with the previous talk. Uh, what do you do if you want to use the free XOR optimization? So instead of sampling these uh, two different keys uh, per wire, you are going to sample some global uh, correlation, delta, and then for every of these uh, wires in your circuit, you are going to sample a single key, okay? So you can say arbitrarily, this is a key for value zero. And now uh, all of your keys for the opposite value, so for value one, 
you are going to define as this uh, key for value zero XOR with your with your global um, correlation. And why do we do we want to have this correlation? Because now we can uh, garble XOR gates for free. Basically, we don't need any ciphertext to garble an XOR gate. And if you want to evaluate an XOR gate, it's very simple, right? So imagine uh, here instead of having an, an AND gate, you have an XOR gate. Um, I will move my my mouse around it if I could, but that doesn't work. Uh, so um, so you take your two input keys, right? The key for uh, the left wire and the right wire. You XOR them, and and you can you know thanks to this correlation, you have that the XOR of these keys is either going to be uh, the key the XOR of the keys for value zero of the input uh, of the input wires or that plus delta. So those are the only two options. And now you can keep going. So this is uh, how you get the XOR gates for free. Okay, uh, so now, how does this look in DMR instead of YAL? Well, what we have been saying, now you have N keys instead of having a single key. Um, so you have two pairs of N keys and one of each of these uh, N keys is known by uh, the corresponding part. You do the same thing, you permit the rows, et cetera, et cetera. And you are encrypting each of these uh, keys that you have for every party under these two vectors of keys. So you use the two N keys to encrypt each of these N keys, KW1 to KWN. Okay, and this makes your gate very big, as you can see. And uh, if you want to do free XOR, uh, the idea is the same as in the two party setting. So you, you are going to sample uh, a global correlation delta that is going to be a vector of correlations. So you're going to have one delta value per, per party in the protocol. And then, uh, and then you define the keys in the same way as in the two-party set. Okay. So what we want to do, reduce the size of this gate. And this will also bring us like more efficient computation and so on. Okay, so um, now I'll, I'll need to talk to you a little bit about the learning parity with noise uh, problem and how we are going to use this to, to garble our gates in our protocol. Um, so I'll, I'll just start with the, the decisional uh, variant of the LPM problem. So it, it goes as follows. I'm, I'm using green here for values that are public and yellow for values that are secret. So the problem goes like this. I'm, I'm going to sample uh, some random matrix uh, uh, C. I'm going to sample uniformly at random as well some secret uh, S. And then I'm additionally going to sample some error according to some Bernoulli distribution. And I'm going to give to you both this uh, matrix C that is public and the result of uh, you know, multiplying uh, C with S and adding this uh, this noise, this error. And now what this problem says is that, you know, for, for certain parameters, um, this is something you cannot distinguish from like a uniformly random uh, value. Meaning that I can either give you this or I can give you a random matrix and a random uh, uh, a small c, and you won't be able to distinguish between these. Um, okay, so, how can we use uh, this problem to do encryption? It's very simple. So you have this that this this um, this value c, right? It's a small c. It's something that looks uniformly random. Um, so now what you're going to do is that you are just going to add to that uh, some encoding of uh, of whichever message you want to encrypt. So this matrix G here is like the generator mat matrix of an error correcting code. And uh, so you are just going to encode M. And this is going to let you, like, if you know this uh, secret key S, now once you, once you, uh, you know, let's, um, this slide would be useful for that. So once you, once you know this, uh, this value S, which is SAB in this slide, you can just take uh, out uh, the product C times S, and then the error correction 
is going to to remove this uh, value e. Okay, so I went a little bit ahead just to show you that, but it's it's very simple. Okay, so you and this is you can think that this is uh, secure because c is some sort of like it's like one time padding basically, right? The result of this uh, g times m. Um, okay, so now how can we apply this to garbling? Uh, when we are garbling, right, we're encrypting under under two keys uh, every time or two vectors of keys in in BMR. Um, so if if uh, if you don't have the free extra optimization, this is a very simple thing to do. You can ask just sample two random keys. Uh, now you add these two keys together and you take this as the key in the in the LPN encryption system that I just gave you and you do everything the same and you know the the message that you're going to encrypt is the the output key uh corresponding to that entry of of the garble gate and this works uh, perfectly fine if you don't have the the free XOR encryption as i said uh so now what happens if you if you do the same thing right with, with free XOR? so you would have your your global correlation delta and uh and then you sample one key per wire, and the problem is now that if if you if you do the same thing of just you know XORing these two keys uh, of the inputs together, um, you instead of having like four possible different values right for this SAD over there, you're going to have only two possible values right. So S11 is the same thing as S00, and this is precisely because we have the free XOR correlation right, and the same thing for S01 uh is the same thing as s10 over there and this, this and this comes precisely because uh because we have the free XOR optimization um so you need you need to do things a little bit different here and the first thing you could think about uh you know is uh, okay rather than having a single matrix c and a single secret sab i could have two matrices I could have uh, one matrix for the C for the left wire, multiply that with the key for the left wire, a second matrix for the right wire, multiply that with the key for the right wire, and then everything would, would work fine. Um, but you know, this, this is not ideal because now we, we have like, I'm not going to say duplicate, but we have uh, significantly uh, increased uh, the cost of, of, of garbling gates and of evaluating gates. So um, we would like to do something better than this. Um, so that's what we do. Um, we 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 can make this work out uh, with free XOR uh, by introducing some permutation. Okay, so th this is going to permute uh, the bits of of uh, of a given key. And uh, so, you know, imagine you, if you, so I'm talking about, yeah, permuting, you know, the bits of the key, not permuting in the key space. So like if you shift all the bits of your key, like one position, that's like a permutation of these bits, right? Um, and now this, this uh, value SAB, uh, you can just define as the sum of say the left key plus this permutation applied to the right key. And everything else is as as before. Okay. Um, so this might sound like why why is this even possible? But I'll I'll, I'll quickly tell you how. So now we are, we are back to having four four keys, right? We can either have this SAB or SAB plus delta, or we can have SAB plus sigma of delta or we can have SAB plus delta plus sigma of delta. Basically, the thing is that now we, we, we have kind of artificially made two correlations from, from one correlation. We have delta and we have sigma of delta. Um, and the thing is that with all of these pre-XOR uh, constructions, you need to be careful about um, proving their security. And uh, this is something if, if you have been uh, here during the first talk, you, you heard about all of these correlation robustness, uh, circularity issues, and so on. So here I'm, I'm just talking about the same related keys. It's, it's, it's a different way of, of talking about the same thing. So um, the the um, 
if you think about the way garbled circuits are going to be used, as parties evaluate the, the circuit, they are going to retrieve some of the keys. So one of once they learn some pair of keys, KU for some value A, and the key for the right wire for some value B, then they're going to learn one of these SAB values, right? So the security of all the remaining uh, rows that are not decrypted are going to rely on either you know, the secret uh, delta, the secret sigma of delta, or the secret delta plus sigma of delta. Um, so you know, there's this kind of correlation between your keys now, between the way you use these keys uh, for encryption. Additionally, we also have that um, uh, the, the messages depend on the keys. So this is like a circularity issue. And um, yeah, so you know what you're going to encrypt also depends on delta. And uh, what, what we do in our paper is that we prove that this construction is actually um, secure. So it's uh, secure for like, you know, you actually need to bundle these two things together. You cannot study them separately. Uh, related key and key dependent messages. This has been done before, like, but with like um, theoretical goals by, by Benny Applebaum in, I don't remember the year, I think it was, or the conference, I think it was maybe TCC 2013, but I'm not really sure. Um, and we proved that, uh, you know, uh, using this permutation only harms your security by uh, as many bits as the number of cycles that this permutation has. So going to the example of my permutation is just shifting uh, the bits of the key one position to the right, you only lose one bit of security by doing this. So this is pretty great. Uh, we, we can do this uh, simple garbling uh, that you would be able to do without free XOR at essentially the same price. Okay. Um, so, I don't have so much time, and I'm I'm just going to talk very briefly about the protocols we build from this uh, way of garbling our gates. So we have two protocols, and um, the first one uh, is consists on basically authentic authenticating your whole garble circuit. Um, so if you think about uh, LPN, it's kind of this, this encryption uh, mechanism that I presented to you. It's it's very MPC friendly in the sense that, you know, these matrices are public. And now as long as the error and the keys are secret shared, as you know, elements of F2, uh, your matrix vector product, uh, you can compute by this uh, F2 linear uh, relations. So this is like local computation. Once you have these uh, errors and keys secret shared. Uh, the problem here though, is that uh, you need to sample uh, these errors within MPC uh, because nobody should know these errors. Then, you know, that's not the game of that I that I have given you for security. Um, so th this makes the preprocessing quite slow in this aspect because you you need to come to do all this oblivious sampling. Um, but this uh, somehow allows us to to choose our error correcting codes in a better way than the the next solution I'm I'm going to to tell you. Okay, but and th this is kind of like the simple basic idea. I think it's also good to, to see how you use the, uh, the gate garbling that I gave you. Um, okay, and our, our second uh, protocol um, doesn't do any oblivious sampling and uh, it's more on the spirit of, of, of this uh, paper, the HSS 17 that Carson was mentioning uh, during the previous talk, so that was uh, by Peter, Carmit, and I on, on A17. Uh, so, where the, you can introduce some sort of error in the garbled circuit. And uh, for this kind of protocol, we, we assume that we have uh, some proportion of the parties which are honest. So, say one out of 10 parties are honest, so C equal 10, or whatever. You can just set C to be whatever thing you want. Um, and then uh, what, what we exploit here is that instead of parties obliviously computing these garbled gates, they are going to produce locally um, weak versions of these gates. Okay, and what do I mean with these uh, weak versions of these gates? So they, they are going to consist of weak 
uh, LPN ciphertext that you would be able to, 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 to break if you had them separately. Uh, but they are going to satisfy the fact that if you add all of them together, they give you a secure LPN ciphertext. Okay, so you need to, to calibrate the way people sample, sample this noise locally uh, so that when all, you have all of this noise together, you get something that, that, is, uh, that gives you security. And uh, so, and then in order, you know, to protect these individual shares to be seen by the adversary, we basically, you know, you can just have some uh, random sharing of zero when parties send in, uh, send the, this weak ciphertext so that, you know, you can add all of the ciphertext together and you get your secure ciphertext. But otherwise, if you look at each of these uh, individual messages, they look uniformly random to you. So this is great. Now we have the same number of oblivious operations and the, as in the best previous works uh, for um, for garbled circuits in the multi-party setting. Uh, but the problem that comes here, though, is that, uh, and this was mentioned by Karsten in the, in the previous talk, is that the way you identify whether you abort or not in the protocol in, in BMR and in HSS uh, 17 uh, is by looking at your copy of this, uh, you know, your individual element of this vector of keys. So now if I'm part I, I, I cannot check uh, whether I should abort or not after evaluating a gate, which is something I could do uh, on the on HSS 17 by looking at my key, if, if I have one of my two keys as a result of evaluating the gate. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to get into this. Uh, there's not much time, but in, in we there's different ways you could deal with this. What we do in the paper is introducing some, some output gates that give you this kind of error detection uh, back to see whether you got one of the two possible, it, it's to see if, if, if the protocol went fine. And uh, yeah, and additionally, like dealing with this, um, with this adversarial error plus the LPN error, uh, that, that makes uh, proving uh, online security a bit messy, but uh, that this is something we do as well. Um, so I want to finish just with talking a bit about uh, efficiency. I was, I was saying that we have concrete efficiency in mind, um, but you know, it's also very much a proof of concept, what, what we provide, like these numbers could be significantly improved, but here are the ones we have uh, at the moment. So um, if, if you compare like, you know, uh, evaluating AS obliviously uh, between 128 parties, uh, you know, the, the best previous implementation took, would take you like around like two seconds. And in, in our work, if, if, we, if we use this uh, first variant, uh, it takes us like uh, 1.7 seconds. Uh, if also, if you want to compare what's the crossover of our work uh, and the previous best. Uh, so, so basically you see here that for 128 parties we do slightly better, right? Than, than this uh, uh, WRK paper. Uh, and it's around 100 parties that we start to do better than them. And uh, this is comparable to this, if you look at this, um, this BLO 17 paper that, that did um, constant size uh, garble gates um in the passive setting they also have a crossover of uh, uh, when parties are 100 or more they start being more efficient than you know their their counterpart uh with uh, a factor of m blow up in the number of parties and uh so that's uh, that's one metric to look at another metric you might want to look at is like how much slower are we than this uh, blo 17 protocol that is only passively secure so if, if we take as a unit uh how, how efficient it would be to compute BLO17. If, if we're comparing a protocol that is really only AND gates, uh, we would be like 10 times slower than this passive protocol that doesn't have free XOR. But of course, once we start having XOR gates, we, we, get, uh, we reduce this gap, uh, right? So if you, if you look at, for example, again, the, the AES circuit that has a significant amount of, uh, you can compete with a significant amount of like XOR gates compared with the number of AND gates, we only are like twice uh, slower than this passive protocol. So, and additionally, I would say having free XOR is something nice because we are all kind of used to, to think about linear operations being for free in our protocols. So I think this is something that helps, you know, people using protocols, I think kind of assume this at some point, right? So it's good to fit that um, idea. 
And um, yeah, as I said, there's, there's room for implementation, uh, for improvement in, in these results. Uh, so yeah, we use this trick uh, for uh, with a permutation to, to encrypt our gates. Um, we also sample the matrices for LPN using the ASNI instructions. So we just use counter mode with AS to sample this, uh, this matrix matrices for LPN. And you know this this part of the computer. This is basically like ten percent of the time you 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 spend when when evaluating uh, your carpal circuit. Uh, but on the other hand, decoding is is actually uh, kind of slow. Um, so ninety percent of the time we 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 spend in our implementation is in decoding. Um, um, what we use uh, for our error correcting codes is some concatenative codes because these are easier to implement and to analyze uh, you know potential failure probabilities when you sample these errors. Uh, so there's different ways in which you could improve this. If you if you stick with the concatenative codes that are easier to analyze, uh, you could use these upcoming instructions by Intel, these GFNI instructions. Um, that were actually thought for, for error correction codes, but they, they give you basically instructions to do more efficient arithmetic over GF238. Uh, otherwise, you could also use uh, better decoding algorithms. You could uh, use like uh, generalized minimum distance decoding. And uh, if, if you're willing to drop the concatenated codes and, and work a bit harder to get uh, more efficiency, you could uh, think of using instead some low density parity check codes or the quasi cyclic. Uh, low density parity check codes. So all of these things, we think they would significantly improve uh, the numbers from the previous slides. But you know, at some point you you need to to stop working in your paper and, and move to the next one, right? And um, we think uh, you can still see the trend, and that it, it, it's it's good enough our experiments to see um, the trend. Um, so yeah, I think that's it from me. Uh, I went a bit over time, sorry, if there's any questions. Okay, thanks very much, Eduardo. I don't see any questions, and I think we don't have any time I, now anyway. And while, you're, while you're setting up, Peter, may I ask uh, one question? So you say, yeah, sure. Eduardo, that there's this, um, so that each of the contributions of the parties in the like the second version mm -hmm. is kind of a weak ciphertext that is breakable, but then you, uh, you, do, you, you throw a zero sharing on top, and then uh, you add that up, and boom, there is the um, there is the whole circuit, and that's then secure. But if the whole circuit is is the sum of all of this, that still allows me if I'm a dishonest party. Uh, so I mean, this is still a dishonest majority, right? So there might still be um, I might still be able to reconstruct uh, the honest party's um, uh, contribution ciphertext simply by subtracting all of my ciphertext from the sum, right? Because the, the sum sharing is not removing this. And you said that these are themselves weak and easy to break. So how are you, um, how are you solving this? Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Uh, so they are weak in the sense that this is something I didn't say with words, but you can see on the slide. If you sum all of the honest uh, uh, ciphertext that are weak, you get a mm -hmm. secure ciphertext. So it's not that okay. summing all of the n cipher, all the n weak uh, ciphertext gives you a secure ciphertext. Got it. Is that if you sum up to the number of honest parties, then you get a secure ciphertext. I see. I see. So you need. Uh, so if you if you have a this if you have like if you have worst case one honest party, then you need to set your parameters high to have enough noise. Yeah, uh, it's uh, so, you shouldn't. So 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 you need a you need a you need a fraction that is uh, that is big enough, right? You need more than one honest party to. Yeah, I mean, you could set D to be to be, you know, yeah, to have like a single honest party, but that doesn't make so much sense. And, uh, yeah, for and that, also, for I would for say that we are thinking about uh, like you know large scale scenarios. So I think that assuming mm -hmm. that there's no adversary corrupting, you know, simultaneously more yeah. than ninety percent of the parties is like pretty reasonable. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, for the for the one hundred uh, party setting, then like where you ran experiments, what's uh, what are we talking about? Is the fraction of honest parties there? Um, that because one we're BL... using the first variant, so okay. there we're using the first variant. Ah, okay. Because for BLO, you only need one honest party, right? Yeah. I yeah, see. yeah. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, so let's wait until Peter is back. Let me unshare. So he said can... he said he's gonna be back in one two minutes. Ah, okay. Well.